All right, let's get started. So good morning, everyone. And well, for our friends and colleagues based in Europe or in Asia, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, welcome to the Central Asia Program Seminars. My name is Sebastian Pirouz. I'm a research professor working with the Central Asia Program at the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at uh, George Washington University. Uh, so we are going to focus today on uh, concerning and sad events that broke out in Kornobar Badarshan, so in Tajikistan, uh, Pamir region, a uh, little bit more now than 10 days ago. And so far, uh, as far as we know, at least uh, 50 people uh, have been killed. And these events, of course, raise uh, many questions uh, on uh, the reasons for this conflict, what this means for the Pamiri populations who are under the repression of the Tajikistan political authorities. Uh, this also raises many questions about the development of the region, and stability, and what uh, that also means for uh, Rahman uh, and his government. So to address these events, to address as many questions, we have three excellent speakers. I mean, we all know uh, the region extremely well. Uh, so we have Sirojid in Tolibov, Suzanne uh, Levit Sanchez, and Samira uh, Dildorbiakova. So uh, each speaker is going to present between 10 and 12 minutes. The presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. So please feel free to send uh, me your questions in the chat box. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I would like to uh, thank you all for being with us, uh, being with us today. Uh, so we're going to start with Sirojidin Tolibov, who is a managing editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Tajik Service. Cyril uh, Shidin is an expert on security matters, uh, Islamic groups, human rights, and social and economic issues in Central Asia. He has reported on operations against Islamic militants from the main hotspots in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Afghanistan throughout, throughout his journalist career. And prior to uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Cyril Shidin spent 20 years with the BBC World Service Central Asia's unit as a reporter, manager, news anchor, and editor. So, Sirojidin, the floor is yours. And thank you again for being with us today. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this, you know, very important event, I think, uh, because situation in Tajikistan remains very tense, especially in Kordobadashan region which is very valuable uh, you know, with extremely you know, nice people and you know, a very ancient history. The current uh, round of confrontation between the government forces and residents of Kharna Badakhshan uh, began back in November last year after 29-year-old uh, Gulbeddin Ziobekov who was known as a local leader among the youth and uh, as a local sportsman was killed during, uh, uh, while uh, police forces were trying to arrest him. Um, uh, uh, rallies followed this uh, incident, uh, which escalated into clashes with the police, uh, continued for uh, several days and thousands of people were killed. Uh, 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 at least three people were killed, dozens of people were injured, including, you know, from the local uh, law enforcement uh, agencies, uh, officers. As a result, local authorities uh, nevertheless agreed to, uh, to make conscious, uh, concessions and uh, to make a deal with the local population, promising to objectively investigate the murder of a young Pamiri guy and punish those responsible. And also not to detain those who went to rally uh, to demand uh, justice. However, the investigation into Ziobekov's death was not yet uh, brought visible results. Um, and uh, uh, those immunity promised to, to participants of the 
rally also were also not met. Uh, uh, in, uh, in addition to that, you know, several uh, leaders of, of Hamidi young people in Russia were uh, arrested, including that uh, uh, Amridin Alawachoyev, uh, he was kidnapped first in Russia and then taken to the Shamber. He was sentenced uh, to 18 years in prison on charges of hostage taking and illegal imprisonment of uh, citizens. And similar scenario happened to Chorchambi, Chorchambiyev, a semi-professional MMA fighter from Badashan, who was very popular among the young people, among the youth of uh, Pamir, and not only Pamir, but Tajikistanis as well, uh, uh, because uh, he was very good, well-known vlogger. Uh, he had uh, hundreds of thousands of followers on, on, on the various platforms of uh, social media. He was also detained first in Russia uh, and then uh, brought to Tajikistan and he was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. So that was the final drop into the anger of uh, Badashani people. As a result, uh, the next day, many people gathered and, uh, uh, in Khorok and demanded, you know, um, in addition to those previous uh, requests, uh, they put several other requests, including the uh, 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 the resignation of uh, leaders uh, of Badashan, local authorities, including the government of uh, of Badashan province and uh, the the mayor of uh, Khoru, and they also demanded, you know. Um, uh, to to withdraw all these you know uh, blog posts uh, in Horok, uh, but at this time government was very angry, and they sent uh, more troops, uh, special forces, uh, and used uh, tear gases, um, uh, and then uh, and then bullets as well. As a result, you know this crowd of hundreds of people were dispersed. And the next day in the center of Rushan, it's a district, um, you know, police launched a special uh, operation uh, and uh, many people were killed. So first we learned that then 21 people were killed. It is probably the worst event since uh, 2012. Uh, so unfortunately the government has no, uh, hasn't uh, responded, you know, uh, openly, the, the the government is trying to how to say to to stop uh, uh, people to, to, from talking about this. You know, uh, even the semi-independent news uh, websites uh, were forced to, to uh, you know to, to keep silence, and uh, they announced that they're not going to to publish anything about the events in Badashan. Activists were arrested in Dushanbe, and uh, several. All the cases were in, uh, in, uh, criminal cases were launched against uh, well-known uh, Pamiris in Dushanbe. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this uh, may result, you know, with further unrest uh, in the region, not only in uh, Badakhshan but other parts of Tajikistan. And uh, uh, we hear, you know, different claims and accusations from the government. Uh, now against donor states, uh, um, uh, the Tajik government uh, published two documentaries, uh, films on national TV, accusing um, a former general, his ex-wife, uh, who is well-known journalist and human rights activist, and uh, uh, Muhammad Bokir, Muhammad Bokir, uh, who was killed also, you know, several days ago. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but you know situation in the region remains tense and um, even those who live in exile opposition forces you know um, the you know uh, say that you know nothing has left but you know to raise the arms against the government it is very unfortunate uh, and uh, this region is very volatile you know uh, unemployment is very high and uh, many people from this region go to Russia or other countries uh, 
and remit sent the remittances is the only hope for the local population. Uh, although the territory of this region is, uh, you know, consists of 45% of Tajikistan, um, uh, only through 230,000 people live there. And uh, this is, you know, uh, probably one of the best, you know, touristic uh, attractive places uh, in Tajikistan. And uh, it is very unfortunate that, you know, all these intelligence, uh, well-known people um, just, you know, express deep sorrow and they don't know what to do and how to how to react to this uh, behavior of uh, the central government. Are you done? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah uh, Our next speaker uh, will be uh, Suzanne Levy Sanchez, who is a non resident fellow at the American University School of International Service. And uh, she's also a retired associate professor of National Security, Security Affairs uh, Department at the US Naval War College. Suzanne is the author of many publications, including uh, the Afghan Central Asia Borderlands, the State of Local Leaders, which was published by Rutledge in 2017. Uh, she also published uh, uh, Bridging State and Civil Society in Formal Organizations in Tajik Afghan Badakhshan, which was published in 2021 by the University of Michigan Press. And uh, she will have another book published very soon, I mean, next year in two, uh, 20, uh, 2023, uh, entitled Field Work as a Craft, a Practical Guide to Doing Research in the Real World, which will be published by Roman and Littlefield International. So thank you so much, Suzanne, for being with us today. And the floor is yours. You're muted, Suzanne. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here and I appreciate being among such um, uh, such experts. Um, you know, I was thinking about what I should talk about today because there's so very much in terms of the reasons for the violence currently going on. So I thought I'd start with the issue of autonomy in the region and, and because I think that is almost the basis, the fight for if they have autonomy or not. And it, so if you think about the pre-Soviet period, and I'm not a historian, I am a political ethnographer, but it's important to understand it. You know, there was a, a very robust um, mm, statelet. Statelets were there. There were um, many local leaders and there were um, governing principles and those were slowly taken away. And there was uh, de Kulak as they uh, the, the elimination of local leaders um, once the Soviet state formed. And during that time, what's really important is as the Soviet socialist republics were formed, the province of Gorno Barakhshan was designated as autonomous. So when the delimitation and the demarcation of all the Central Asian republics occurred, those are the legal territorial designations for that area. And that is kind of a sticky wicket for the Tajik government. And it has been for a long time, given the placement of Gorno Barakhshan in the region and its central location. So in 2016, the, there was sort of rumor that the government of Tajikistan was going to withdraw the autonomy, autonomous designation, but they really couldn't because the um, sort of spats between Kyrgyzstan you know, and con the conflicts and whatnot that happened between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and other areas that are sort of have questionable delimitation areas along the borders, are, they always harken back to those original borders. So if they take away that autonomous designation, it opens a Pandora's box of all the borders in the region. That's one thing. And why is that important? It's important because the local leaders and the people of Gorno Barakhshan um, consider the area to be semi-autonomous. Um, and the government of Tajikistan in all the, during the um, 
after the Civil War agreed that it would remain autonomous. Now it has taken out all the local leaders um, that they view as resistance in all the other areas of the country mostly. So gorno Badakhshan is the last hub and Kharog is the strongest area for them not to be able to have full control, but they can't take away the autonomy. So what do they do? They start saying there's terrorism there, it's unruly, those local leaders can't actually um, control the area, the civil society isn't controlling it, there's hooliganism, and there's all these different things. And, and they really started more aggressively with that type of operation in 2012, when General um, Nazarov, I think that was his name, <laughs> um, was killed along the border, and then there was a major operation there. And then in 2014, there was another major operation um, that killed a number of local leaders and caused the burning of, of buildings. In 2018, it happened. 2021, it started again. And they extradited these leaders. They killed this, this um, uh, Zio Bekov, who was um, killed from Roshkala. Um, he... Uh, allegedly had gotten into a fight with the prosecutor over the harassment of a young woman. Um, and um, uh, Yodgar Faisov, the former governor, had kind of kept a lid on them, searching for him and arresting him. And then the, that once Yodgar Faisov was taken out and knew the new governor, Mirzona Bodov, came in, the prosecutor was allowed to go after him and they killed him. And so there were protests over the killing. So over the years, there have been killings and arrests of local leaders. And each time there's a protest, there's a blacklist of people who are involved in the protests and then the government goes after them and then you know quiets down for a while and then it starts again. And this last one, I would say, is the worst since the Civil War. And some argue that it could get worse than during the Civil War because of the impunity in which the Tajik government is currently arresting and killing and um, using newer weaponry to go after uh, citizens and journalists and any leaders. I mean, if you think about it, they're going after Olfat Hanum. Uh, I believe she was uh, threatened and or tortured for her confession, Khobash Khobashov. Um, and there, and then the translator who was at that meeting, um, Shifa, I forget her last name, I apologize, um, it was also arrested. Um, in, in, and so if you look at the whole picture, what Tajikistan is calling this is an anti-terrorist operation. Now, why are they doing that? Uh, well, the U.S. has largely withdrawn from the region. And they also want to get more funding. And China wants that roadway going through Bar Harok, where um, Colonel Mohammad Bukher, Mohammad Bukherov was controlling to some extent. They want that clear so that trade can flow through there. Um, and that's one of the Tajik government's um, stated missions for their anti terrorist clearing operation. And then, you know, the Allegedly, the Russians sent some mercenaries to support as well. Well, why did Russia support? Some say that um, that uh, um, the Russian government was given information by the Tajik government that the West was trying to start a coup in the area, and so they should go there. But also, if you look back at when Crimea was invaded by the Russians. Um, the operation in 2014 happened soon after that. And there was a huge ramp up of anti-Western rhetoric at that time in Tajikistan. And there was a series of events, which I outlined clearly in my book on bridging state and civil society. Um, and, and it looks like that sort of um, propaganda effort against the West is starting. There's also been some, um, uh, uh, um, I don't know what you want to call them, like KGB bots on Facebook, stating that AKDN is um, supporting and funding these terrorists in the region. We all know that's not true by any means. And when you start 
you know, when you start thinking about the area uh, as full of terrorists, um, you know, Pomeries and Ismailis have really never been known to be in any way uh, radical or terrorists or religiously radical or whatever they want to call them or cooperating with the Taliban, which is another rumor that's coming out. And so I, I think that when we think about the violence, it's, it's sort of simplest to look at it in terms of the Tajik government wants to gain control of the region. It cannot designate it um, non-autonomous. And so it has to find other ways to find an excuse to try to gain control. And there's a huge amount of both traffic and trade that goes through that region. And they get a lot of funding from um, China and there's a lot of flow from China and there's also a lot of mineral wealth in the area. Um, so there's this, this sort of undercurrent of other things, but it bubbles up into this conflict, you know, um, that really has been going on for, for since the civil war. And, and that's the, the means of, of, and what I mean by the conflict is the um, conflict between the um, uh, non-Pamiri Tajiks and the Pamiri Tajiks that are there. Um, and it's, it's uh, in, in terms of what might happen in the future, it's hard to say because as they kill these uh, older local leaders, they actually have a calming effect on some of the younger um, sort of budding leaders and the other local leaders. Um, so it depends on what those groups do, but it might also in a very scary way pacify the population kind of like with the Uyghurs if they continue their operations and um, it could get a lot worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Uh, so we have a third speaker who uh, is not on the announcement of the event, but who has a huge knowledge on the region. So we thought she would uh, be a great contributor to the uh, discussion. And this is Dr. Zamira Dildorbiekova, whose research focuses on the Tajik Pamiri community of Korona Badarshan region and uh, on social religious development of Pamiri population following the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. So Zemira, the floor is yours and thank you very, very much for being with us today. Well, Sebastian and the organizers, thank you very much for having us on this panel. I also would like to thank Cyril Judin and Suzanne for setting up the scene for my further discussions. Uh, those really uh, enabled to kind of delve a little bit further to discuss the community itself. So, so I think to build on what you've already mentioned is that, that when thinking about the Tajik Pamiri communities, predominantly resident in Gorda Badakhshan and even beyond, it's really important that we debunk a few myths, Susan, as you've mentioned, created in the last couple of months, and particularly in the controlled media, yes, Sir Jadine, and, and, and which is dominant, uh, one of the dominant sources of in information today. So the first myth is really about um, the justification for conduct or the need for anti-terrorist operations in the region and related accusations of, uh, of, uh, of links with the Taliban, of uh, Talibans of Afghanistan, with the aim to destabilize socially and politically the country and the region. So that's the first myth. The second myth would really relate to the idea that the Tajik families engage in violent actions and many have political ambitions as opposed to the exercising their civil or human rights within the legal framework of Tajikistan. The third myth I would say is this, that Tajik families do not see themselves as part of the Tajik nation. I think this is another wrong assumption. And, and really have been played into uh, fueling the practices we see today. So the spread of such disinformation in my view is indeed damaging and to anyone with limited knowledge of the region or who hears or reads about the recent events involving targeted often unsanctioned practices against the community, such as mentioned by my colleagues, may be seen or perceived as justifiable. And I think this is a danger. The alternative local narrative is largely suppressed and the huge lack of research, unfortunately, on the community and any 
Uh, I mean, Susan, you're one of the few who really uh, have performed studies on the community. Probably Tim, Tim Mastanlovsky is another one. But, but this huge lack of research on the community, and particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and any literature around it hugely impedes the grounded analysis and understanding of the situation on the ground. So uh, to debunk those myths which I've just mentioned, I feel like it's important that we begin by pointing out that anyone who knows well or researched the Tajik Pamiri community recognizes the profound transformations mm -hmm. in their sense of identity, including national identity, and how the community came to perceive itself since the breakup of the Soviet Union in early 19s and their subsequent reunion with their global spiritual leader, the Aga Khan, many may know him as such, following 70 years of isolation, Soviet isolation. So there is also this tendency, I think, another dangerous ten tendency to link current events to the outbreak of the bloody civil war 30 years ago and the involvement of the Tajik Pamiris in the conflict as part of the Tajik United opposition to the incumbent government. This, this, these facts are correct. However, this, and this is a valid link to understand the trend and the actions of the authorities, including their justification for their practices today. However, in my view, it, when it comes to the understanding of the community's involvement with the events today, as opposed to 30 years ago, it can be a dangerous link to elaborate. The parameters or lens we use to view those events 30 years ago, the reasons for the involvement of the Tajik Pamiris in the conflict, and the political ambitions they held at the time, although pro-democratic, are no longer applicable or valid frameworks for today's analysis of the events. Some critical developments have happened in the last 30 years, which led to Tajik Pamir is becoming largely apolitical, apolitical. There has been a significant shift in their perceptions of their identity, including national identity. From as early as the breakup of the civil war, the messages of replacing violence with the dialogue, working with the government, seeing themselves as part of the Tajik nation, and working towards the betterment of wider communities in which they live, was, were the paramount and prevalent messages coming from their spiritual leader, the Aga Khan, and those been in turn Analyzed deeply by the community. I mean, for the, just a small mention of what it means to be, uh, I mean, led by the Aga Khan is that Pamiris also happen to be um, a religious, uh, their faith as a faith community, it, it's a Shia Ismaili Muslim community. And it is also happens to be a minority community. The, uh, the Shia Ismailis are the second largest group of uh, Shia Muslims uh, uh, around the world. And Pamiris or Tajik Pamiris, Tajik Ismailis, whichever way you call them, they are uh, part of the global Ismaili community. So the Aga Khan is the spiritual leader and according to the uh, three principles in Islam, uh, the third particularly the Imamat after the Tawheed, the notion of the oneness of God, which is the first you are shared with, the, with all Muslims, uh, the, the notion of Tawheed, the oneness of God, the notion of Nubuwa, the, the prophethood, uh, and the third, which is shared with the other Shia Muslims, is the Imama, or the you know the guidance of the Imam. And the Aga Khan is the Imam. So the the following of the Imam and his guidance is the profound um, kind of ident. Uh, it's a doctrine for the uh, Ismaili Muslims to 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 do that, to follow that. So so whatever messages are coming from the uh, Aga Khan are really are engaged with dearly and and, and internalized. And there has been a consistent messaging such as this from the imam, not only to the community in Tajikistan, but globally. And even in the recent events, I mean, the, the, there's been a talika, the, 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 the guidance from the imam again, reminding people to stay calm, to not resort to violent actions and work within the government. I mean, those messages are also, uh, I mean, there on the smiley.org um, 
websites, so those could be even analyzed. But so this is kind of what I'm trying to get to. There's been these profound transformations in how Ismailis view, Tajik Pamiris Ismailis view themselves today. And, they, and, and, and it's fascinating development when we clearly see the community's perceptions of their identity entailing the appreciation of the ethnic, religious diversity, and uniqueness of all peoples in Tajikistan. And Pamir is seeing themselves as community explicitly being part of the Tajik nation. It probably hasn't been at all the case or partially the case um, before the outbreak of the civil war. I mean, it was a mutual thing among uh, Tajik Pamiris or other Tajiks. So, but today they talk about the necessity for them as Tajik Pamiris and Ismailis to live in peace and abide by the laws of the country. So the peaceful protests, which we see in November, which we saw in November and recently, are really placed within this framework of abiding by and respecting the state laws. And if we see the footages from the recent events, I mean, from the mobiles taken by, by, by the locals from, from November and recently, there, there is no involvement of arms or any external forces. So I think it's really important that we start, uh, or those who may not be that aware of the region and, and the events, we understand these critical developments within the community itself and their perceptions of what it means to be Tajik Pamiris in Tajikistan today, not 30 years ago. Okay, so um, Sebastian, please, over to you. Thank you, thank you so, so much, uh, Zamira. So, uh, well, we have, I mean, of course, I mean, this raises plenty of questions. Uh, so let me start with the first one, which is what stops the government of Tajikistan, uh, which says to be democratic. So what stops the government of Tajikistan to step forward and start uh, peaceful negotiations rather than sending its troops to uh, repress and kill its citizens? Any of you can respond. Anyone? Well, it depends on, on their goals. So if, if, uh, if their goals to, are to actually um, create a peaceful negotiation with the civil society leaders um, and be a democratic country, they would, but they are going in the direction of an authoritarian dictatorship at this point, which means that they want full and complete control of every um, aspect of um, the civil society, leadership, institutions, economy, et cetera, at this point. Um, so I think there were ample opportunities for the Tajik government to be engaged as they have in the past, I mean, in 2012, after the fighting, and in 2014, they, there have been negotiations, and, and civil society leaders have formed, and, and they have met. It still has been, um, prior to the fighting, um, violent, and, and there's killing like this time. But this time, um, the authorities said they were going to after the November shooting, and then they really, they really did not. And instead, they started hunting for leaders at, uh, and others at, to arrest who was involved in the protests and the, and the negotiations never happened. I'm not sure why um, it's different this time, but I could you know, suspect that because there's more of a Chinese presence militarily in the region as well as Russian and less of a, of a US presence, um, I do think the Tajik government I can't, I, I shouldn't say how they think, but it seems like their actions um, highlight that they are acting more with impunity and, and less with a con reconciliation. Last, last bit on that is that um, President Rahmon does often come in after a conflict like this and um, present himself as the father of the nation and the reconciliation you know, uh, creating reconciliation. Um, the Aga Khan has also, uh, um, His Highness has also often stepped in to negotiate reconciliation. Um, that is, does not appear to be happening right now. I don't know why. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, second question is, uh, shortly after the assassination of Mohamed Bokirov, uh, several media outlets associated with a, rev a revolutionary guard and militant 12 Shia groups, for example, Kataib Hezbollah, made statements recognizing Mohamed Bokirov as a martyr that actually the Tajik state had terrorized. So the question is, what explains uh, this sudden interest, considering that uh, Nizari Ismaili Shia and 12 Shia communities have not been closely associated? I'll probably take this question, but sure. I, I, I don't feel that it may be just coincidental. I don't feel there is anything beyond than that. Uh, so I also see some questions in terms of the, you know, uh, a question, how can the Agahan probably intervene and, and support? So I think one, one important, I wouldn't be able to talk on the Agahan's behalf, of course, but one important aspect is that um, the civil war had had bloody consequences and and but the, the the stance has been work with the government be part of the nation so it and it is consistent even today the messaging is the same i think uh, leaving agahan aside i feel that uh, to resolve the situation so far we haven't seen much political will from the authorities to do that so it also feels that yes there is a sense of impunity and uh, invincibility in a way uh, which comes with it. But I feel that there might be some, and, and it also feels that the international community has spoken, but it doesn't have much effect or impact. There should be some, some significant uh, impact where authorities may feel uh, um, that they need to change their attitudes. I, we also hear quite a number of the conspiracy theories, and again, to some of the questions around China, right? So initially, many researchers or even an analysts of the situation have felt uh, and still do feel that, look, it is the last region which is going to be uh, suppressed kind of thing, you know, uh, but more and more people start to, to think that it's probably beyond that. It's probably now to do with the territory itself. Ultimately, yes, uh, Badashan Ismailis are only 3% of the population, but they reside on the 45% of the autonomous region. And, and there have been already uh, instances of the land being given uh, to China as a repayment for loans, which we've never been able to be, uh, or kind of up until this point been repaid. So it's, it, it is seen uh, in some kind of conspiracy theories that it, it's, it's a, an, a, an attempt to suppress the community to the extent where they won't mind or won't be able to, re to oppose any of the um, giving away of the land or Chinese military presence. A next question is considering uh, the repression and violence going on, uh, what is, what would be the role of the United Nations or other international organizations in protecting innocence and stopping uh, the governments uh, to conduct this violent repression as this is happening now in Tajikistan? Anyone wants to answer? Yeah, so Eugenie, you're, mute, you're muted. You're, mute. you're muted, Eugenie. Okay, uh, so I'll try to answer this question. Uh, you know, uh, ironically, the Tajik government, uh, through the state media, of course, not the government, let's say, as a, a special documentary film which was made, you know, several days ago, um, uh, in a point that I finger on uh, the donors, on uh, unknown, uh, Western countries uh, helping, you know, organizers of these uh, riots uh, financially and giving advisors. Um, and then we have uh, persistent but unconfirmed reports uh, from Tajikistan that, you know, uh, diplomats of uh, some Western countries are being expelled from uh, Tajikistan, which is unprecedented uh, to, to a small country which relies heavily on uh, and the financial uh, the donors uh, support throughout its history. Um, 
and uh, I think in this in this situation, uh, the Western uh, countries uh, diplomats may uh, could play you know uh, more uh, you know the more central role on solving this issue by giving you know direct um, um, recommendations uh, openly saying that you know uh, that you know Tajikistan needs support of Western societies donors, but uh, with this uh, kind of an approach, uh, um, repressions, uh, it cannot uh, rely uh, on further support from the West. Um, today, uh, um, I think the Tajik authorities feel invisible they may think that you know uh, now everybody, all these world community is busy with Ukraine, and we can we can solve this problem without you know uh, you know being unnoticed. And um, and uh, the Pamir region has always been in a hot spot. Uh, it was a bastion of uh, um, you know it was the last bastion of of, of in Tajikistan where uh, people could at least freely express their opinions. While you compare with other regions, uh, there was no such uh, freedom. And um, uh, by repressing or silencing the dissent in this region, uh, uh, some experts believe that, you know, Tajik government, Rahman's regime is, uh, is uh, preparing ground uh, for for his uh, son uh, Rusam Emomali, we don't know for sure. But but uh, uh, in this uh, situation, Western society could play uh, more essential and uh, and press more directly to uh, you know authorities in the Shambha that you know without uh, support of uh, donor countries, Tajikistan simply cannot survive. So. Um, um, if there is no democracy or freedom of speech, then there, there is no help either. Um, I think I think uh, somehow um, soft power is not uh, used uh, by many leading countries, and now it's very essential in this period of time uh, to tell the Tajik government that you know um, don't do that, stop it, uh, because. Uh, this unrest may spread to other parts of the country, and uh, with Afghanistan, uh, with uh, Taliban in power in Afghanistan, uh, this civil unrest may may uh, turn into a second civil war. Simply, it's very easily. Thank you. Uh, we uh, we have several questions on. Uh, how a neighboring states actually analyze or respond to these events, for example, of Iran, China, and Russia. And uh, maybe a more specific question about Russia to, uh, given the historical bonds between Russia and Tajikistan and Russian Pamir, do you see Russia as a possible mediator in resolving the tensions between Central Asian government and Pamir? I think there was initially um, some hope that the intervention of Russia may uh, stop or de-escalate the events, but I think more and more with, with what we're seeing is that it's a complete opposite. And it does feel like we've gotten back to the Stalinist times or even pre-Soviet times uh, in the ways how the events are evolving and de developing. Uh, I mean, the, the only instance of Russia deporting its own citizens to be trialed, uh, I mean, in courts in Tajikistan is, is unprecedented, but also it, it's very hypocritical when there are events, uh, I mean, when they, they justify their presence in, in, in the neighboring country for protecting their own people. So, so that's kind of one of the uh, very uh, interesting, if, to, to say the least, developments. Also, Tajikistan uh, and Badakhshan, particularly as Suzanne has happened, has always had this geopolitical significance for the region. And, and Badakhshan being almost half of the uh, 
uh, ter territorial land of Tajikistan also present a critical danger to Russia. What if these free-minded people decide to uh, become independent as a separate nation? I mean, these, are these discussions sometimes are overplayed sort of to justify again the authorities' uh, actions, but there is not much desire to be independent because I think there is an understanding that yes, this is 45%, but majority of it is mountains, right? So there is no infrastructure to be an independent country. It's currently is relying massively on the external provision. The people currently in Badakhshan are suffering from, uh, I mean, from, from lack of uh, food and, 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 you know, other stuff going into the region. I mean, the same situation during the civil war for six months, the economic blockade me meant that people were starving until the humanitarian aid has arrived. So, so I feel like uh, Russia wouldn't have um, desire to step in and intervene or at least support um, Pamiris in the sense that, uh, that Pamiris would, would like to. Uh, maybe thank you, Zemira. Maybe one more question on foreign reactions because we have a, I, I received a lot of questions on that. Uh, what has been what have been the reactions of U.S. government and the Agekan to uh, respectively to uh, to these events in Tajikistan in the Pamir? Anyone willing to respond? Um, yeah. To be honest, I have not seen, uh, I've been watching for the US government to uh, react in some way. The UK government and OSCE, um, EU, there have been statements um, calling for a de escalation of conflict and decrease in human rights violations. And um, there's been support. I, I honestly have not, I don't know if any of you have, but I have not seen the US government publicly make statements about it. Um, but I could have missed that. Um, and I, uh, in terms of the Aga Khan, um, from my sources, I've heard that there have been a, a couple of um, um, non-disclosed meetings. I don't know what's going on there. And I don't even know, I can't, I, I, since I haven't witnessed that, I can't say that that's true or not. Sorry to be so vague. No problem, um, no problem. Siroji, yeah. do all, Zemira, anything to add on that? I had one thing on the Russia ish on the Russia aspect um, in terms of uh, their potential for mediation. I, I had heard of various meetings with Pamiri um, leaders in Moscow with uh, higher level Russian government officials. So there was some hope that there would be mediation. Um, but after Rahmon's meeting with um, uh, whatever meeting it was in, with Putin on uh, May. 15th, 16th, I think. Um, it, it's been fairly clear that that is not the direction Russia is headed and that they are supporting the Tajik regime in this operation. That's how I see it. Thank you. Uh, let's move back maybe uh, to the uh, uh, domestic policy of Tajikistan. Uh, uh, and there's a question on how uh, can the people of Badarshan use their autonomy? In which ways? What is the benefits of being autonomous? Does it uh, exist really in the region or is it just a paper or a document? Suzanne, yes. Oh. Anyone? I'll, I'll be very brief and then Zamira, please. I, I just, because I spoke about the autonomy, I don't mean to dominate the conversation by any means. Um, I think that my experience in the region is that the autonomy is important in terms of having free speech and um, a certain level of independence and in civil society, but it is not exactly, as Zamira said, a goal of being separate from the country at all. I, I have not seen that at all. I've never, you know, that that is generally not what is said, but the autonomy is so that they have some control over civil society, their own agency, some aspects of the economy, which they have very little control over, and um, and freedom of religion, I think. So. Zamira, do you want to add anything? You're muted. We don't hear you, sorry. 
Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say that I'll support Susan's your your, your um, understanding and explanation of the of the situation. Yes, autonomy. Probably there was more of that, and 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 Tajik Pamir is being able to exercise it before the. I mean, in the first half of the. 21st century, not first half, the, the, the first decade of the 21st century, uh, but then more and more, just like with the rest of the Tajikistan, uh, the, 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 the power with autonomy or with other aspects of life has been really reduced to almost nothing. Yeah. Thank you. We have more questions about uh, I mean, the reactions of uh, uh, the Tajik authorities, how they've been managing this crisis. And a question is, before and now, uh, Tajik authorities have blamed the crisis not only on terrorism, but also uh, on criminality, including, for example, drug trade, smuggling, etc. So how far is this totally uh, illegitimate, uh, uh, to a totally illegitimate pretext, or is there any overlap between local informal leaders and a lawful or shadow economy? Yeah. I'll jump in if you, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, we have to, uh, Pamir, you know, has extensive border with Afghanistan and during the civil war, uh, it was, you know, so, you know one of the, uh, main hot points of drug smuggling from Afghanistan uh, to Pamir and to Kyrgyzstan and further to, to via Kazakhstan to Russia and Europe. Um, and yes, there were several, you know, uh, groups uh, uh, which uh, played a, a huge role in drug smuggling. And there was a cigarette smuggling from Tajikistan, from uh, Kyrgyzstan to Pamir and from Pamir to Afghanistan. Um, uh, yes, but uh, but over the years, uh, these uh, you know, illegal groups uh, um, either were annihilated or uh, uh, ceased to exist, and so they didn't exist at all. Uh, at the moment, I don't think that uh, there are any you know uh, powerful groups, uh, illegal groups in Badashan, which uh, can resist. Uh, openly to, to the central power, uh, central government. Uh, many problems uh, of, uh, uh, they are mostly uh, connected to the social and economic situation of the people. Poverty, unemployment are the major factors of uh, uh, people's anger. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the central government uh, Instead of you know the finding common language with the local population, tries to use the power and uh, to solve this issue forever, like uh, it managed to do uh, so in many other parts of the country. As I said earlier, Pamir was the only place where freedom of speech, you know, relative uh, freedom of speech, and how to say uh, expression of views existed until recently. Now, uh, I think the government is uh, uh, is willing or is very keen uh, to settle, uh, to establish uh, total control over the region, like in other parts of the country. I think uh, it is nothing to do with autonomy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe to go on with uh, Harman's uh, policy, uh, a question is, what do these events mean for Harman? Do you think that there could be a risk for his regime security? Uh, this is, I mean, probably an important question because, of course, I mean, Tajikistan has been uh, for a long time, but has faced for a long time many issues, including uh, economic poverty, authoritarianism, a very high corruption of society, but also of Harman and his government. And that said, we are currently in a particularly difficult period where all the issues are coming up, in particular the consequences of Putin's war in Ukraine. So what do these events mean, maybe combined with all the issues, what all of that means for Hartman and his regime security? 
Uh, yes, um, Rahman, uh, can you hear me? I will continue. If, if. Sure, sure, of course. Rahman, Rahman uh, is trying, you know, to 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 establish an absolute power over the state, and it is uh, visible to everyone that uh, he's trying uh, to reinstate the power of his son after himself. And um, and he is uh, uh, Rustam Imam Mali is the second person in power now, and um, without you know complete, um, I would say, um, control um, in all parts of the country, it is impossible to hand over the power to his son. And events in uh, Kazakhstan uh, this year in January and February played a major role uh, in. Uh, uh, in taking decision, uh, and uh, yes, uh, I think I, I think the visit of Rahman to uh, Moscow played a major role in harsh approach of uh, government forces uh, to the events in uh, incidents in uh, Pamir. Um, I don't think that uh, Rahman would be able or would take, you know, such a drastic decision without uh, at least getting advice from Kremlin. Thank you. Suzanne, Zamira, do you want to? Yeah, sure, Suzanne, go ahead, please. Well, I just want to say that someone sent a link to the U.S. government statement regarding um, the escalation in uh, Gorno Barakshan and they are echoing the same statements and, and they were actually in a joint statement with the UK, EU, etc. So they're part of that statement. So I wanted to clarify that because I didn't know. Um, I'm just going to bring up the, the um, issue of, of security of, of the regime, but also the um, briefly the issue of trafficking in the region, which I wasn't sure I was going to talk about <laughs> Or not, but um, you know, if 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 you think about that, the Kyrgyz uh, Tajik route has been sort of cut off, and the Uzbek route has been a little bit cut off. So that Gorno Barakshan and particularly the Osh route has become a main uh, form of trafficking through the region, and the Taliban have happily continued trafficking across that border. There has been an increase in addiction. Uh, in the area, which means that there are more willing participants in being mules and whatnot through the region. Um, uh, so there's a lot of money to be made in this trafficking. There's also precursor chemi chemicals coming from the east um, that come in. And um, there's also an increase in uh, methamphetamine production, um, which is coming from Afghanistan across the border. So there's a lot of money to be made and that is a major hub right there. So there is an incentive on the illicit side. There's also an incentive on the legal trade side to get control of that economy. Um, I do think in terms of the security of the regime itself, there's some, um, and him trying to uh, establish a ground space for his son's succession, I actually think that he's putting that in jeopardy um, by doing this sort of extreme control of the region because as um, uh, Sirajuddin said is, you know, so aptly, it's, um, uh, there are other potential groups in the country that might want to join uh, resistance given the intensity of this action and the um, violation of human rights on several levels. For example, lastly, Roshan usually doesn't involve itself in the actions and it did this time pretty heavily and that's very unusual all right unfortunately we're running out of time but maybe uh i mean i i got several questions on uh, human rights so maybe let, let me take that one I mean, what does what do these events mean in terms of human rights of freedom of expression we we've seen for example asia plus uh, which is one of the very few media in tajikistan that can still express more or less independent opinions uh, was threatened with being closed if it covered the events in the premier in a critical way 
uh, and of our hormonal regimes has been increasingly repressive for at least at least a decade. And we all know that the human rights situation in this country is dire. So could this even lead to even more repression? And there is a specific question on how this even led to an increase in harassment or scrutiny on of Pamiri communities who don't live in the Pamir, but elsewhere in Tajikistan. Anyone wants to respond to that? Hey, I mean, they're, they're, the repression has increased and I believe it will increase. And um, I have uh, friends who are being hunted in um, uh, Pamiri, colleagues and friends who are being hunted in Bishkek and in Russia and other countries, and they are scared for their lives. And many have contacted me uh, for help. Um, and um, they're terrified. There's, they're also hunting aggressively for various local leaders that were supportive of, of um, Commander uh, Colonel Bocquer and um, they are also terrified. I've had family members of people calling me um, and crying, and I, I think that the repression is very intense. Um, there have been reports of, of torture and interrogation. It is difficult to um, prove it, but there have been many reports of it. Um, so I'm sorry if I'm a little bit off talk. I get a little emotional about this, but um, I think that uh, um, the human rights violations will continue and the repression will continue. And I, I am scared for the population, both the diaspora and the one in the country personally. Thank you, Suzanne. So, I mean, we need to conclude, but let me uh, maybe just to wrap up, uh, ask a concluding question, which might be, of course, a very large question, but uh, what uh, would be needed to restore trust between the Pamiris and their government and to bring long-term stability. To be, I mean, this, you could use that as maybe some concluding remarks. Yes. I think, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I, think, I think the most important thing now is to, uh, you know, uh, for the government to, to spend some, uh, to, to, to make uh, some financial support um, uh, to the region. Uh, to, it is impossible to raise unemployment, but at least they could raise the salaries of teachers, uh, doctors over there in various uh, remote areas. And plus, you know, uh, uh, to provide with food, uh, with uh, uh, food that, uh, that uh, the government can do that, uh, can talk to the local leaders to negotiate with them and to solve this issue peacefully. Um, uh, uh, now it's, uh, there are deep wounds, uh, uh, you know, and people are very, uh, feel offended. Uh, they, they feel betrayed, you know, which is uh, um, if government uh, keeps using this uh, uh, using the, the, the uh, say, so did you muted, you muted, so she did, sorry. I don't think that, that they can give uh, visible results if they keep using force. Uh, uh, finance. You muted again, so she did, sorry. The, the, uh, 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 local leaders uh, uh, to give them more power, more independence, more freedom uh, uh, to settle this problem, uh, to settle this issue uh, in uh, in a very short period. Otherwise, I don't think that you know uh, uh, these method can can achieve uh, may give results in nearest future. Um, uh, this situation is still tense. Very tense. And just probably to add and conclude, if, if possible, of course, is that I don't feel that the community is asking for much. Uh, they, they, they've, they've been asking and throughout this time just for um, bringing the peace back to the region, to the country, restoring the, the, the law, the fair trials and upholding the human rights. 
I think those are those were the those were the key demands of the not even demands something they were calling for, and 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 I think what needs to be again clarified is that there are no political ambitions this time round uh, from within the community. There is no, I mean, the whole term political, actually, politics became a very, has acquired a very negative connotation within the community, but in fact, across the Central Asia. So, so, so yeah, there are no political ambitions. It's just the peace the fair trials, the human rights, which are being asked for. And, and, and I've seen a comment there, you know, so did the international agencies fail? Probably to some extent they did, but we do still need their presence today, perhaps in, in helping the community, in getting educated about what the legal framework is, how they can work within the framework, but also getting this positive approach to politics. Politics does not mean always opposing the government, you know? So, and I think it can be really a fruitful, um, collaborative coexistence between all people of Tajikistan. And I think if we've managed to get over the civil war for five years, which took away so many lives, it, it can be easy, not easily with, with, with lots of effort, it can be done again. So it's not too late. So we do call on, on the authorities to stop the violence and begin, come and talk and begin the negotiations. Thank you, Zemira. Suzanne, do you want to add anything? I actually think Sarajuddin and Zamira summed it up really well. I, I um, completely agree. I think, I think what was said about the um, Pamiri um, area being part of Tajikistan is very important. And if the government would begin to take that seriously and negotiate with the leaders as part of the country uh, versus being some kind of outsider or resistance or dangerous whatever, because they are part of the country. And, and I think the Aga Khan is very clear in his, all of his statements that you need to work with the government, but it becomes very difficult to work with the government when the government starts killing and um, harassing its own people. So the people are simply requesting for them to be included in the government structures, to have ec economic inclusion and to be able to um, uh, have reasonable salaries so they can support their families. And I agree with completely with Zamira. The, the requests of investigations of some of these killings and some of the human rights violations and for a legal framework that is uh, legitimate is they are not huge requests. They're, so I right, thank you for this um, amazing. All right. Panel. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're very late now. We really need to, uh, to, to, to conclude. I mean, there's obviously much, much more to say. I really apologize for all those who sent questions I couldn't take, but uh, I, I, I mean, there were really many questions, but well, unfortunately, very sadly, these events are going on. So it will probably organize more events on what's happening uh, in Tajikistan. So uh, I would like to thank again our three speakers today for their great presentation, for these great discussions. I would also like to thank our audience and we look forward to uh, having you again in our Central Asia Program Seminar. So thank you very, very much and have a good day or have a good afternoon or have a good night. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.